Good evening, and welcome to the Facebook Live Milford Readers and Writers Festival, Doing It Right. I'm Edson Whitney, and I have the honor to be the co-chair of the festival, along with Carol McManus and the amazing group of talented and committed board and committee members who are bringing this event to you, the readers, for the fifth consecutive year. But before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that today is September 11th and to remember and honor those we lost 19 years ago today. Despite the pandemic, we're excited that we can take the festival global this year with our virtual platform and bring the festival to you wherever in the world you are. First, I'd like to thank Greater Pike Community Foundation and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts for their generous support. Now, for those of you who have not attended before, this festival is focused on the readers. Our tagline says it all, readers, writers, conversation. You'll note that the readers come first, inspiring and engaging in conversation with the authors and with each other. We have a lot of conversations to inspire you with this weekend, three evenings of conversation at 7.30 Eastern time and one afternoon on Sunday at one. You, the viewers, can hit the share button and tag your friends in the comments to share these amazing conversations as we are live now. So we're very excited to begin the weekend this evening with Gloria Steinem. Gloria headlined our inaugural festival five years ago and has graciously returned for this event. Gloria needs no introduction as the icon of the women's movement and a tireless voice for women everywhere. Founder of Ms. Magazine, among her other pioneering accomplishments, Gloria will be interviewed by her longtime friend, and first editor of Ms. Magazine, our own festival co-founder and board member, Suzanne Levine. The topic of the conversation is how the women's vote can shape the election. A lot has happened, as we all know, since Gloria was last here in 2016. Multiple crises that were unanticipated and unprecedented. Tonight, the conversation is very timely as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage by looking at how the gender gap may play out in November. So the format is the conversation will be for 45 minutes followed by questions from you, our audience. You can post your questions in the comments and they'll be posed by Amy Ferris, another festival co-founder and board member. While all the events are free, your donations are welcome and are fully tax deductible via the donate link in the comments or on our website at milfordreadersandwriters.com. So we're just in the green room with Gloria and Suzanne. They're very excited, as are we all, to bring you our first virtual um, Readers and Writers Festival. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Now sit back and enjoy the conversation and let's all welcome Gloria and Suzanne. There we are. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Edson, very much for that wonderful introduction of our festival and us. Um, I, I just want to thank Gloria also for coming back. Um, who knew that la the last time she was here, we were getting ready to celebrate the first woman president? We had no idea that we would not only not achieve that, but in, within those four years, go through some tumultuous and, and exciting activism. There was first, there was the Women's March in Washington, which at, was a show of strength and inspiration. Uh, there was the Me Too movement, 
which uh, uh, brought into the consciousness a problem that had been going on for a long time. Uh, Black Lives Matter, again, another issue that we are grappling with. And if that's not enough, we have a plague. So uh, it, it's been quite a time and uh, it's almost inconceivable that that happened in such a short period of time. But what I'd like to do is start back in ancient history to give people some context. There it goes. Uh, so I thought we could start uh, when we met, which was 1972. Uh, we were working on the first issue of Ms. Magazine. We were in that funny little office on Lexington Avenue that was furnished with three-legged desks and uh, orange crates. And uh, I remember when I walked in, you were sitting on the floor in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, have to, I have to tell you, you don't remember this, I'm sure. But just to show how long ago this was and how uh, times have changed, here's where I was when I walked in that door. I was wearing a pink silk blouse, a pink pencil skirt, and a girdle. <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, didn't take long to realize that uh, times were changing. And so I thought we could talk a little about what the world was like back then uh, when we walked into that little funny office. Well, I have to point out, Suzanne, that when you walked in, you were the only one of us who had actually been the head of an entire magazine and published an entire magazine. And from that day forward, you have been truly the editor of Ms. Magazine, way more than I, who was always off on the road, bringing back little scraps of paper saying, oh, this could be a story, that could be a story. <laughs> and and you were running the magazine. But uh, those, uh, those uh, little pieces of paper are hardly insignificant. You brought back, <laughs> I mean, you brought back ideas that helped us all. Um, move forward. So you shouldn't do that. Women shouldn't do that. Belittle themselves. <laughs> no, but I mean, just in real life, who was who the editor was? But you, it was you. But uh, also, uh, there had been no other women's. Or to, to put it another way, women's magazines were not owned and controlled by women. <clears throat> they were essentially, and to some extent, they still are, although it's improved, uh, catalogs of, of uh, clothing and household goods and, you know, depending on the magazine, uh, catalogs of things women should buy. Uh, and there was hardly any editorial material. There might be an article, maybe a short story or a poem. Actually, the poems and the short stories had pretty much disappeared by the time we started Ms. So I just wanna emphasize that our motivation for starting the magazine is, in, is an indication of where we were then, which was the revolutionary nature of having a publication that was owned and controlled by women and that could publish uh, you know, articles and fiction and poetry and we hoped would come into women's homes like a friend, you know, because it would be on the newsstands and it would be in the mail. And I, this was very revolutionary at the time. All right, now we have the web and hopefully at least some of the web comes into women's homes as a friend. Though I'm afraid <laughs> some also comes in as an adversary, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, but it uh, wasn't always uh, uh, interpreted as a friend. We heard from so many women who said, uh, I left my magazine out and um, on my desk and my coworkers uh, 
freaked out or I got it in the mail and my husband opened the mail and he freaked out. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of uh, putting the magazine, keeping the magazine to ourselves mm. because yes. it was very challenging. Yes, because clearly, I mean, this was a feminist magazine. It was women who supported equality for women. <clears throat> and um, this was quite bizarre. I remember we used to get requests from women who said, could you send it in a plain brown wrapper? Right, right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but just uh, to put the larger context, um, here, here were some of the circumstances that women were dealing with at that point. Uh, I had just gotten married, so that me meant that I couldn't get a loan uh, without my husband's signature. Uh, if I wanted a job, I had to look into the help wanted female column, where there certainly were not the same kind of appealing jobs that there were on the other page. Um, Gloria was talking about renting an apartment uh, uh, the other day, about uh, single women weren't allowed to rent an apartment because they were afraid they were prostitutes. So, uh, Gloria, you had some other examples. Uh, well, you're talking about uh, credit cards. I had to get my mother to sign to guarantee an American Express card for me, even since I wasn't married. I had no husband to guarantee it, right? Even though I supported my mother, right? I mean, you know, it was quite quite irrational. <laughs> uh, and and also, I remember that um, a uh, you know I had been uh, part of Show Magazine, an, an arts magazine that only a few people may remember. <clears throat> and one of the editors there, who was a friend who I knew very well, uh, called up a friend of mine once we started Ms. and said. I didn't know Gloria was a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, there was here. The, I think the crux of it was that because people couldn't imagine an equal relationship, or few people could imagine an equal relationship between men and women, if you were a feminist, you must be anti-male or somehow rejecting any. Uh, relationship or even friendship yeah. with men. Now, I say that because we are way past that. Right. And the vast majority of women now consider themselves feminists and many men also consider themselves feminists. So one of the good things about being old, which I am, <laughs> is that we remember when it was worse. Okay, so <laughs> we can bring optimism, I feel, and young women can bring anger which certainly everything now deserves anger. And that's why we should organize together. Whose line was it when somebody said to her, uh, are you a lesbian? And she <clears throat> said, are you the alternative? Oh, that was the wonderful Florence Kennedy. Florence Kennedy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a great uh, civil rights activist and civil rights attorney and my speaking partner for many mm -hmm. years. I hope people who don't know her will will Google her and get to see her in her wonderful Aussie hat. Yeah. And so on. <laughs> and she is great. Right. She and because great. we were speaking together and it was so bizarre to some people that two people, two women were speaking together and perhaps especially a black woman and a white woman speaking together, that some guy in the back of the auditorium did yell out, are you lesbians? And she did said, quick as a flash, are you my alternative? And it was perfect because people fell out laughing. <laughs> well, as you said, laughter is a very important ingredient of revolution. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad that you point that out because I think it's very, very misunderstood. Um, or to put it another way, laughter isn't taken seriously, shall I say? <laughs> but... It, it, it turns out, and I think the Native American cultures have been, could teach us this, that, that laughter is the only free emotion. It's the only emotion that can't be compelled. You can make somebody afraid, obviously. <clears throat> you can even make someone believe they're in love if they're dependent for long enough because you kind of enmesh in order to survive. Mm -hmm. 
but you can't make somebody laugh unless they, they really want to. So it's a kind of proof of freedom and uh, it's very precious. So one good rule of thumb, I would say, is don't go any place where they won't let you laugh, <laughs> even church or temple or whatever. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But I was also thinking about one of the missions that we uh, gave ourselves was to name some of the conditions that women have been dealing with um, that we couldn't talk about because they didn't have names. Mm -hmm. um, sexual harassment way back then, uh, family violence. Uh, I remember you always said, it, we called it, we just called it life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was true. I mean, uh, domestic violence, battered women, uh, you know, all these things did not have names. And so naming as, uh, trying to think of the wonderful philosopher, I'll think of her name, is that naming is the most magical uh, part of our consciousness, just to name something. Right. Suzanne Langer, I think, said that, right? Oh, good for you. <laughs> a name. <laughs> a name. <laughs> um, in the very first issue, you ha wrote an article called Women Voters Can't Be Trusted. And I think that was the first place where uh, the gender gap, <clears throat> while not named, uh, was described mm -hmm. and um, at that at, at that time uh, I think the, the assumption had been and the argument against women's suffrage was that women's votes wouldn't matter because they would vote just like their fathers or their husbands and uh, at that point um, I think you found some numbers that were very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that uh, Bella Abzug and Shirley Chisholm and others of that time <clears throat> were pointing out that women did not vote necessarily. There was a big gender gap. I mean, Bella, I believe, named it the gender gap. Um, and it was more profound uh, with black women than with white women. Uh, but, you know, in any case, very, very significant, that women were way less likely to vote, say, for military spending and more likely to vote for uh, health, education, welfare kind of spending. That at one point in history was called conservative. Now it's called <laughs> radical. So <laughs> the kind of label we get. To right, right. But nonetheless, it's been it's been quite consistent that the gender gap makes a, a huge or can make a huge difference. And certainly in the last election, when we saw that 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton and 51% uh, of white women voted for Trump. I mean, many more men, white men certainly voted for Trump. So there was still a huge gender gap there. But uh, it's, it's important to look at that, and it's rarely reported on, even now in the daily press. How do you account for uh, <clears throat> all those white women who voted for Trump? Uh, well, I think to be fair, we have to understand, although black women were smarter than this, but that after eight years of one, <clears throat> sorry, I'm hoarse, after, after eight years of one party, it's almost always the case that people vote for change for the sake of change. So I think that was probably true of, of a lot of people. Um, but I think for the most part, they were not college educated and they were married and dependent on their husband's identity and incomes. So you might say they were voting their husband's interests mm -hmm. and were either not voting their own interests or considered their, well, they were dependent. So their, their interest was their hus husband's interest in many cases. 
Do you have any sense that some of those women are uh, changing their thinking? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think since it turns out that he has sexually harassed and attacked at least 30 women, and since he closed, so clearly can't deal with women at all, <clears throat> that those numbers have changed. Well, we'll see. And including <laughs> among white suburban women, which is a group that he is counting on and beginning to discover he can't count on to the degree right. he thought. Right. There was another interesting statistic in that first article of yours. Uh, women were asked how much they uh, were ready to change or approved of change in itself. And the white women were reluctant. They were like 35%, I'm happy to, I'm looking forward to change and the rest not. Black women were the exact opposite. They were uh, enthusiastic about change and uh, brave enough to want to embrace it. And I think partly that's because their circumstances were certainly in more need of change. But also I think it's, it's an interesting sense of where um, we are all coming from. Mm -hmm. You keep talking about change and I think uh, it's still scary for people. Uh, yes, well, your, your point about, <clears throat> about need is important. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Apparently, I haven't been talking, so I'm, <laughs> now I'm more. Do you have a glass of water? Uh, wait a minute. I have a cup of coffee here, I think. Okay, here. Maybe that will <laughs> no, thank you. <clears throat> but I think that, that w what we have come to see is that Black women are the most influential a uh, group of voters in the country, the most decisive, because they're the most unified and the most conscious of injustice. And so they have come to be very, very important. Um, and, you know, this is, I think this has helped us to rethink and look at again, the history of the women's movement that you and I are talking about of the, of the current women's movement, because the reporting on it has sort of sometimes behaved as if the women's movement was all white, the civil rights movement was all black, and actually mm -hmm. black women's history has not been properly accounted for in either one. But in fact, uh, black women were way more likely to be feminist and support equal rights and were in, in the, the leadership and we're just beginning, in fact, with two friends of mine, I'm writing a book that's <laughs> trying to uh, identify the black women in the 60s and 70s and 80s who were leaders of, of, of the women's movement and not properly credited. Right, right. Um, I was actually talking to Susan Faludi, who uh, was at the festival last year. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how this uh, the virus has brought to the fore and reversed a lot of the uh, issues that we thought were settled, um, like uh, caretaking, like housewifery, uh, like uh, giving up your job. To, to stay home because you had to, um, to uh, um, anyway, to, to family violence. I, apparently the numbers have really gone way up uh, um, and you can't, you can't imagine uh, why not when people are trapped in their houses with um, family, whether they start out liking them or not. Um, so it gives, it, it, there's a sort of a sense, I think she was alluding to, uh, that we've lost so much ground uh, that it's going to be hard to get back to where we started. Well, <clears throat> we've lost ground, <clears throat> but we've also gained vision. You know, I mean, in a way, the virus is a threshold 
uh, it has caused us to see divisions of rich and poor and essential workers who aren't paid as if they're essential. Uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's, it, and why don't we have universal health care, which obviously we need? It, it's, it's caused us to see many things in a new way. Uh, the, the virus doesn't pay attention to our gender, our race, our class. It doesn't pay attention to national boundaries either. Why do we? You know, I, I, I think uh, we can't change what happens, but we can use what happens. So I'm hoping that we can use this consciousness that we have now because of this, uh, you know, totally unexpected and unrivaled and amazing and tragic circumstance that we are in to, to change our consciousness, to understand the importance of universal health care, to, to understand that national boundaries don't matter. We're all citizens of spaceship Earth. So that's the challenge to me, you know, mm -hmm. to not, not to try to change what happens, but to figure out how can we use this? And how can we get from here to there? Well, part of, I mean, part of it is what you and I are doing now. It's just consciousness. Uh, and for instance, <clears throat> so I'm sorry, because men have been home more, doing more child care, there's more understanding of uh, what it takes and what it means, you know, to live with babies and small children. And of course, men become whole people by developing patience and attention to detail and all those things that are wrongly called feminine, just like we become whole people by becoming more mm -hmm. daring or assertive outside mm -hmm. the home. So I think it's, 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 it's causing more, it could be causing more wholeness in the attitudes of men and boys because we are together in a way and they are seeing the household as their mm -hmm. universe in a way that they never saw before. But I think, I think the, the key to it is figuring out how we can use what's happening and also getting, getting rid of the shoulds. You know, we too often have a case, what should I do? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking whatever I can, you know, what, how yeah. can I reflect what I want and what I do every day? Uh, well, how is that going to play out in the next two months? What are you looking for in terms of... Well, I, uh, obviously, the, the, the virus we have in the White House is the <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely dangerous. I mean, he lied to us about the other virus, as we now know. He totally knew how dangerous it was and uh, lied to, so that he could perhaps keep the economy but you know it's it's insane um i think it's clear from the public opinion polls that he is going to lose and it's also clear to him which means we have to worry about the postal system which the or any of the ways we vote because clearly as all of his former henchmen have pointed out he will do anything in order to win. You know, I kind of have visions of, of trucks taking away the post office boxes. Mm -hmm. We may have to guard our post office boxes. <laughs> but I mean, the, so the good news is that he's, that a, a, a turnout, a righteous turnout will defeat him. The bad news is that we don't know what he will do to the voting system. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm learning a lot about the voting system in, in all of this process. Uh, I wasn't aware, for example, that you could vote in person uh, early mm -hmm. and that there would, there are places, you can't, there are polling centers, but there are places you can go and the same, it's exactly the same process. And you know, your vote is in the system. Uh, I think there's a lot of educating that uh, people are doing, young people, 
uh, that's uh, also going to make a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. I certainly hope that we will bring out uh, this generation that we are counting on. Uh, yes, I, yes, because obviously young people, it's most important that young people vote, even though they vote less than older people, because they're going to be around for the consequences way longer <laughs> than, than mm -hmm. we are. Uh, it, there's a lot of information online, as you point out. There's also a very good documentary that I recommend and you can find online called All In. Uh, and it's the story of Stacey Abrams' campaign and the voter suppression efforts in Georgia, mm -hmm. which were quite mm -hmm. extreme. It's mm -hmm. very, very educational and helpful. Uh -huh. and the, I, you know, you are the greatest um, uh, fortune cookie writer. <laughs> <laughs> and every, every time you say something serious, I think of something funny that you said oh good or, so or, <laughs> or memorable uh like all of the i uh, you know excerpts that are in your current book uh with a title with one of your best lines uh the truth will set you free but first it'll piss you off uh, everybody <laughs> right. should make sure to to read that book yeah it's but, a, it's it's a book also, of quotes most uh, you, you know the title is mine, but the quotes are lots of different people, right? Well, my favorite quotes, right? There's some, some are yours. <laughs> but I think I'm thinking of also kind of words of wisdom uh, that like we are linked, not ranked. I think that's one of your <clears throat> most important mm. concepts. And uh, maybe you could explain that. It sounds. Um, it sounds, uh, you know, so simple, but it really well, isn't. It is, it is the shortest way I've ever been able to think of saying what I believe is the truth and also what we are striving to uh, recreate. I mean, I think cultures that were more circular than uh, hierarchical were here before Europeans showed up as we know from Native American systems of governance. And I think we're trying to recreate them in, in a new way. So it, it, it is the, the shortest way I've, I've ever been able to say. <laughs> There's some virtue and shortness you can put on <laughs> t-shirts, you can carry it on banners right. and marching, <laughs> right, right. Uh, which is that we are linked, literally, we are not ranked like this. And the whole idea of uh, ranking because of the degree of melanin in our skin, which only has to do with whether we were in sunny climates historically or not, or because of our gender, or because of our class. It's relatively new in human history. Uh, and as I was saying ab about COVID, COVID doesn't see it. COVID mm -hmm. doesn't see those things. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can use COVID as a change in consciousness to move toward our understanding that we are linked, not ranked. That's a wonderful cut. Uh, to go somewhere totally else <laughs> and ask you a question that I, I know you've been asked before. How, here you are portrayed in multimedia with all these different people uh, playing you. And I know that the Glorias, the Julie Taymor movie, is coming out um, at the end of September. It's going to be on Amazon, I believe. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, I've seen it. it. It's wonderful. And I think uh, Julianne Moore absolutely gets into your skin. There were times in the movie where I wasn't sure which of you it was. <laughs> because she has so she looks better. <laughs> what? She looks better. You have to say. No, she, I mean she had a lot of your mannerisms, and and I can't imagine that must be weird when the other, uh, you know, pl places where you've been portrayed, you didn't look like you, and you didn't act like you, so it wasn't so weird, but. Uh, this is very strange, I would think. Well, it, it's here's how it started. Julie Taymor uh, 
who, besides The Lion King, did, you know, many other genius plays and, you know, um, Frida and, uh, you know, so many things. She called me a few years ago and said she wanted to option my, my Life on the Road, a book I wrote called My Life on the Road. And she's the only person on earth to whom I w would say what I did, which is fine. You can do anything you want. <laughs> because first of all, she's, I think, the great filmmaking genius of our time. And secondly, I knew she would tell the emotional truth. Whether, you know, the kind of facts here and there, you know, matter way less uh, than, than the emotional truth. And she has done that. And she, she has uh, reproduced my father, who was the least responsible mm -hmm. man on earth and the most loving, kind-hearted father. <laughs> and and she's, she's reproduced that. And she's done it on two continents, not just here, but also in India where I was right, right, for right. a couple of years after I graduated from college. And I think she understood that because she did the same thing. She also, as a young woman, went to Asia and oh. lived there for several years. As you can see in her art form, you can see yeah. in The Lion King and so on, how much that influenced her. Right, right. So that, the movie is really a tribute to her ability to tell the emotional truth. Mm -hmm. It's profoundly... I, I, it's not even in the same universe, say, with something like Mrs. America. I don't know if people, anybody is aware of that. It was a television series. A lot of people saw it, yes. Yeah, it was about uh, the, the premise of the series was that Phyllis Schlafly had defeated the Equal Rights Amendment, which was a false premise. She never changed one vote. It was the insurance industry and people who... Uh, we're going to lose money because of the Equal Rights Amendment that defeated the Equal Rights Amendment. So those are two polar opposites. Yeah, I think people don't know about the insurance industry, uh, the role they played. Um, I know you've written about it now, uh, but we've got the Equal Rights Amendment again in yes. play, uh, yes. which is very exciting. Well, it, and all the requisite 38 states have ratified it. Uh, all we knew, all we need to do is win the next election, uh, and then we will finally have it in the Constitution, only 50 years after we have been working on it. <laughs> well, um, isn't there some kind of a movement um, to uh, withdraw some of those votes? Well, the problem is that a, a deadline was put, what? so that has to be removed because, mm -hmm. you know, other amendments did not have a deadline, but Congress put a deadline on this. So that that's why we have to win the election in order to finally get it into the Constitution, because the Republican Party opposes it and the Democratic Party supports it. There are some Republicans who do support it, but it's just not not enough mm -hmm. <laughs> to be sure, right? Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a big supporter right from the beginning. She always yes. thought that that was very important. Absolutely. She certainly knows how important it is, yes. Um, let me go somewhere else. Uh, somebody asked me, and I love this question. What would you tell your 20 year old self from the vantage point of where you are now? <laughs> oh, that's so difficult, isn't it? I mean, but the, my instinct, here's my, my first instinct is to say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I guess part of the underlying beneath that thing I would say is that I believe when I was in my 20s and 30s and there really wasn't yet a women's movement, I was rebelling but hoping no one would notice. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> doing what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, but I thought I was by myself in this. And then fortunately, the women's movement, the civil rights, you know, uh, all the, came along and gave us 
company and companionship and, and a family. But at that point, I, I didn't know that. So that's the kind of underpinning of saying it's going to be It'll all right. It'll be all right. It's funny. For me, it just jumped into my mind right away. I would say, what would you say? I would say, don't waste so much time trying to make <laughs> people like you. <laughs> I mean, when you think how much energy and time uh, we have spent uh, trying to not only make people like you, but make people feel good about themselves, about you. I mean, a lot of uh, time that could have been spent figuring out who we are. So that's that I would well, urge right. Right. my young self not but to go like down you, that road. Your your suggestion is maybe more practical than mine because <laughs> you're right. Because any group that is secondary, because of sex or race or class or whatever it is, is made to feel dependent on the approval of the powerful group. And that is a very sinister way of internalizing the hierarchy. Right. right. Thinking of uh, something Bella Absuk said, thinking of uh, dependence, she said, we've gone from dependence to independence, and now we have to move toward interdependence. Yes, absolutely. Which I always thought was a wonderful way of seeing it. You know, absolutely. You know, sometimes I think the world is divided into two kinds of people, people, you know, people who divide it into two and those who don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so usually that bipartite thing is really a disaster, and she pointed that out. Right. Because, because it's the third unifying alternative that's important. Right, right. Uh, so here we are. Um, people are getting ready to, for this election. Um, do you have, can we come up with some specific things that people can try to do? I mean, as you say, nobody can do what they can't do. Uh, but uh, I think there are a lot of creative uh, uh, suggestions out mm. there that uh, could be very helpful to people who are just sort of, what can I do? I'm freaking out. Well, one thing is you can, depending on where you are, vote as soon as you can. I mean, you know, some some people can already vote, but, you know, of course, they used to say vote soon and often. No, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but do, but do vote soon. Uh, secondly, try to make sure that the people in your circle, online, in your neighborhood, to whoever you have access to, uh, has the information they need to to vote, because your word to them, to someone you know, is way more credible, influential, and important than anything that we see distant, you know, from on screen or from a stranger. The, the word of someone we trust is, is the most uh, activating uh, force, and we can all use that. Mm. It's hard to get to make contact though with people who um, don't, you know, don't even want to hear it. You mean don't want to vote at all? No, don't want to hear the what you have to say. I mean, I think that's one of the problems that we're having now that we're so far apart that there is it's hard to exchange ideas. Well, we're not far apart. I mean. We're far apart, but remember, it's 30 versus 70, not 50-50. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's the 30% the of the country that is uh, racist, let's face it. I mean, you know, Trump is a profound racist that is uh, against uh, or feels anyway threatened by equality of race and sex. I mean, it's or, – or, and or – feels that there is a hierarchy for religious reasons. The evangelicals are the most consistent supporters of Trump. Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's not about changing them. 
they have a perfect right to feel as they feel, though we should always talk to each other, I agree, and, and do our best to, to make human contact. It's, it's about getting out and vote because to vote because the majority in a democracy, the majority wins. Well, I think we're getting close to question time. Um, and Amy Ferris is going to come in and, and uh, read some of the questions that we've gotten. So I just want to say this has been fun. And to quote you, uh, fans, fucking tastic. <laughs> yes, so, uh, my favorite quote. You have to do it again. Well, Suzanne, it's, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. <laughs> Uh, I'm in California, I can explain to people, so I, I don't get to see you. Right. <laughs> and I want to say thank can I say thank you for this book festival? You know, one of the things I've noticed is that in, in all of this time of tragedy, books are really have become ever more important. You know, because um, you know, they're personal and portable and we're home with them. And I notice that when people are photographed at home. They generally, I mean, I, I'm not at home. So anyway, they're photographed in front of their bookshelves. Right, have you noticed right, right. that? Right. <laughs> right. Right. So I think the, the importance of books and of, of this wonderful annual festival has been increased in these times. I think you're right. That's absolutely right. Uh, Amy? Yes. Are we there? There she is, Madam Amy Ferris, who I'm sure have you both. God, amazing. And just thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for being everything that we all want to be. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Suzanne, you know how I feel. So you're my goddess warrior. All right, I am going to give you, start with this question, okay? And I'd like both of you to answer it. It's, this is a critical moment in Black-white relations. How can I, as a privileged white woman, best work with my Black sisters in this upcoming presidential election? Mm. Suzanne, do you want to? <laughs> I've been talking I'm sure you, go ahead. Well, um, you know, I think, you know, when you started the question, the first thing that was coming to mind is that we assume somehow be because it is a racist system and because there is white privilege that it's somehow good to be white, if you know what I mean. But I, w I think it's helpful when we as white people understand that if you, if there were only a hundred people in the world, you know, when they do that, you know, only 30 of them would be white. I mean, do we really want to be isolated with only 30 people and not get to know everybody mm -hmm. else? You know, I, th I think if we see it um, as positive and enriching and, uh, you know, not, not, uh, how shall I say, not not guilt producing or is it, but something we're we're ourselves motivated to do, then uh, it, it will be helpful. Now, what form that that takes in voting d depends on how perhaps we can help make sure that uh, access to voting is the same for, especially for those who are still going to vote physically. The access is more difficult in black areas than it is in white areas. And we we can do our best to work on that. We, we can be in, t in touch in, in, with our local get out the vote structures and ask what we can do. I guess one thing that I have learned or become aware of that uh, I, think is important is that we've got to stop asking black people to explain blackness to us. That's not their job. And um, I think that sets up a, a kind of a chasm 
that they have something that their life is is something that is so incomprehensible to us that they need to explain or that we expect them to invest the energy in enlightening us uh, when we all have a lot of important things to do to change the system. Uh, so I don't know how that affects voting, but it has certainly affected my sensibility. Well, that is going to lead into this question, okay? Which, um, and this is for both of you again, what are your views on the role of the male allies in advancing true equality for women, especially in the era of the Me Too movement? Well, look, there's this radical idea that we're all human beings, hello. <laughs> and so we all have a right to our own bodies and not to be touched or invaded uh, if, you know, un uninvited. Some, sometimes I think that the men that could help other men understand it the best are the men I've met, say, after a lecture sometimes, a man will wait until everyone is gone and come up to me and tell me that he had been imprisoned and be, he had learned in prison because he was younger or weaker and was the se was used as a woman sexually Ooh. because there were no women. He had learned that body invasion is even more traumatic than being beaten up on the outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if he says, says that to um, other men, I think it's helpful perhaps as a bridge to understanding the trauma that, that women experience from being touched or invaded with, with, without our uh, permission or, or wanting. Suzanne? Uh, well, I think they are in need of uh, what we have all been in need of when this movement has been developing is of making contact with each other to use your phrase, Amy, sharing their truths. Uh, I think uh, if men, as Gloria said, could be liberated from the armor that they're in, which I think a lot of men are, I think there are a lot more uh, men who understand and want to change the world the way we do. Uh, I think that whole, I think that the, the um, Gravity has shifted, and there are a lot more of them than those ones who used to try to make us cry. But I, I do think that they there's an opportunity for men to uh, share with each other and uh, give each other that kind of sense that you're not alone and you're not crazy. Mm -hmm. And and that it's uh, the masculine, the so-called masculine role is actually killing men. You know that 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 removing the those ideas of violence and speed and competition and so on uh, will lengthen men's lives. What other movement can offer men more years of life? <laughs> right. Exactly. I think this can right. So, coming off of that, who are your the young feminists most inspiring? Both of you right now, who are they? Oh, there's so many. I, I, you know, I hesitate to even begin to name. I mean, uh, here, oh, here's how you to name. <laughs> what? <laughs> name some. Name some. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I, 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 I really can't because there are just so many. I mean, I here's how I feel basically. I feel like I just had to wait for some of my friends to be born. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know and and I think especially I'm inspired by current little girls of of 9 and 10 who who I meet some here because now I'm in the countryside in, in California who haven't even encountered the feminine role yet and are completely themselves and are also aware of what's coming 
unlike you know, we just assumed we had to conform. Right. Uh, and and uh, I, I just, I'm so, I'm so encouraged by them. Suzanne. Uh, what, I, I don't have names either. I mean, you can't ask either of us to remember a name, but, but I do think that what I find inspiring is, how smart the, these young women are and how confident and how uh, experienced. I mean, we were babes in the woods uh, trying to figure out how to make this revolution. And they've got strategy and they've got alliances and they've got power. A lot of them have a, a good amount of power. So that I think they're going to be able to do <clears throat> what needs to be done um, in a much more effective way than they th than we did. Uh, we did the best we could. I think they're going to do the best they could too. Well, you have an amazing daughter who's, you know, she's following very much in your incredible warrior footsteps. So she's the best. She is the best. She is. So, I agree, and she's not my daughter. And I still think <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. All right, so this is from Diana Weiner, who we all love because she was uh, at the very, she was right at the beginning of Readers and Writers and championed us and was involved with us and all of that great stuff. So this is her question. Didn't the same, that same group of white women that voted their husband's interest in 2016 support Obama in 2008. Some some of them did, but I mean, there's a there's a crossover there. So, which is a good point, because um, it's redeeming, I would say. But some of them were voting for change for the sake of change. That's why I pointed that out, you know, because after after eight years of of one party and there was eight years of Obama, there there is an impulse, the mm -hmm. historical impulse to vote for, for change for the sake of change. And uh, when when you asked a lot of women, they also tended to say, uh, well, he, he's a successful businessman, so he'll know how to run the country. Mm -hmm. Now, those of us who live in New York City know that he's a failure as a businessman, that if he had just invested the money he inherited, he'd be richer than he is now. But people didn't know that, mainly because he was on television constantly, as if he were a successful mm -hmm. businessman. So, you know, that with, without that kind of uh, false publicity, I don't know if he could have won. Suzanne? Yeah. Next question, please. <laughs> So this is from Mary Jo Thomas. And what do you see as the biggest challenge for women in the next 20 years? <laughs> I'm gonna let you go first, Suzanne. Oh, come on, Amy. <laughs> Joking, go ahead. <laughs> uh, That's a big question. It is a big question. Um, I think the biggest challenge is uh, to find the, for each woman to find the issue that matters most to her and fight for it alongside all the women who are fighting for other issues. I think that it, it used to be thought that there was a feminist agenda and that there were 10 points that needed to be enacted. I think now people are saying, where is the women's movement? And it is all over the place. It's in multiple movements. And the only thing I worry about <clears throat> is that we support each other and don't turn on each other. Uh, we used to call it horizontal hostility. And uh, it's such a waste of time. I think the two things that are the biggest waste of time are horizontal hostility 
and reinventing the wheel, uh, <laughs> starting from the beginning in every uh, project and not taking the time or being aware of uh, how it was all figured out before. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I just think we need to um, reverse the golden rule, if you know what I mean. I mean, <laughs> and and understand that we are as important as as anyone else. That the point right. is balance. That and of course we need to stay to do our best to stay physically safe, and help each other to stay physically safe. And aside from that, I would say to do what you love. You know, what do you love so much you forget what time it is when you're doing it? That's probably what you should be doing. Well, I'm gonna ask both of you a question that isn't on the comment list. So I know I'm gonna get in trouble, but what do you think Bella Alves would, how would, how would she be today? What do you oh think? gosh, I wish she were here. Don't you wish? Oh, wow. <laughs> ask that because Suzanne and Mary Tom wrote the best book on Bella. And I know that you loved her with all your heart, both of you. And I just, I think of her all the time because I think what would she do right now? And so she, 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 she would be zooming her way around the country and around the world, fist up saying, we have to get this guy out of the way. <laughs> we have to vote. We have to, you know, boycott economically, you know, she would just be incredibly active uh, and uh, the queen of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the big question is, where is Bella absent now that we need her? Uh, I don't see anybody oh. who is in that role of being, you know, the powerhouse with her shoulders hunched, marching through the halls of Congress, uh, answering the uh, challenges because she knows the rules of the game better than anybody else. Uh, I just see her as so fearless and so committed uh, that I miss that. I, there, you know, there are a lot of wonderful people, and Nancy Pelosi is wonderful, and mm. there are a lot of people who um, are stepping up and identifying uh, the trouble we're in. But I mm. just think Bella would have embodied it and uh, could would lead us over the mountain. Yeah, I mean, there are, as you point out, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters. You know, there, there are all kinds of great women in Congress who are in there fighting. Um, but uh, I don't know, maybe maybe we should start a Bella Abzug revolutionary cell. Yes. <laughs> yes. Where is Bella? That's try, to, Bella. try to use her spirit to yes. reinforce our, our own. Right? Yes. That would actually be quite extraordinary. And... You know, and again, Suzanne, the book that you co-authored, um, I, I think everybody needs to read it. Well, it was the most fun I ever had because uh, it was a chance uh, to live with Bella uh, for two years. And uh, uh, that's why I wish she was here right now. Well, this, this is okay. This is the take home message of this book festival. Read that book <laughs> and then act like Bella. Right, right. Well, uh, Gloria, do you do you think that um, <clears throat> she would be angry or frustrated at where we are now? Are you kidding? Of course. I mean, she she wouldn't be able to believe. She couldn't believe Nixon was there. She couldn't oh. believe. <laughs> no, I mean, she 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 would. I mean, you know, I, I think she would both be angry and frustrated and she would be figuring out what to do about it. Get rid yeah. of the electoral college. That's the only reason he's there. He, lo he lost the popular vote. Right. By like three million votes. He did. And the electoral college w was a, f a function of the slaveholding states. They were the only ones who wanted it. 
And now I've forgotten how many, at least 15, I guess more states have already rejected it. I mean, she would be out there battling the electoral college to get to get democracy once and for all. Oh, Bella. <laughs> so hashtag, we should do that right now while everybody is on Be Bella. Be what? Bella. <laughs> okay, here's a question from Robin Frank. Since so many of us are voting absentee by mail, we may not know the <laughs> answer in the election on November 3rd. So what shall we do on November 4th and 5th? And my comment, P.S. is, Drink a lot, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're, we're on the one hand going to have to be patient. And also, on the other hand, we can pursue any cases of, of wrongdoing or voter suppression that we hear about uh, and, and support the whatever our local systems of, of voter counting are. How would you recommend we do that? Well, it's it's too diverse, I think, you know, because it depends where you are, right? You know, and and what the what the systems are. Uh, but uh, if you if you go online, you, you you will find that kind of information. Suzanne, yeah. Gloria said it all. <laughs> Okay. Um, here, here's a question for you both. Um, I loved your quote, Gloria, that old women bring optimism and young women bring anger, which why, which why we need to organize together. What do you feel about middle-aged women? <laughs> great. That is so great. And how, yeah, how, I didn't mean to leave out. <laughs> middle-aged, I'm sorry. Um, what do you feel in, about middle-aged women in particular to bring to the women's movement and the push for change? And actually, we're all middle-aged, so there you have it. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I'm not, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I think that there, there is a whole generation of women there. I don't know, you know, middle-aged, what does that mean? We're not even ready to except the word old. <laughs> but I think I think there is a generation of women that profited from the women's movement and really made things work and gained power and confidence, but weren't active because they were so busy doing that. And when I think of the, all the women who came to the march the Women's March, and I kept hearing people saying, uh, I've never done anything like this before. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have come, but my roommate, my college roommate said, we've got to go. And I think that's a group of women that uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more from. I think uh, Gloria probably knows better, but I bet you a lot of them are the women who have been running for office. Mm -hmm. Well, and also some very young women have been running for office because they've been activated. But I, I do think there's still a kind of, even though younger women are more active than ever before in politics, we we do as women tend to get more radical with age because we discover that the notions that we were given of what was going to be a proper role are actually uh, more confining. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't want to generalize too much because there are so many more women who are leading individual lives than ever before. Right. In, uh, who, who are um, not having children or have children from other marriages or who I, mm -hmm. are living with other women. I mean, you know, it's just so too diverse to, to generalize about. Uh, but we're not going to leave out anybody. And I think in a, in, in a way, if we're part of a big group and it doesn't look like the country in terms of age and race and class, then we should try to make it look more like the country. Right. That's a great answer. And 
So here's a question that goes right into that. Are there lessons you want to make sure younger women learn from your experiences? Uh, I would say don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, listen to yourself. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here to help. But <laughs> I think there's a unique person inside each of us uh, who, who loves to do something, uh, you know, wants to express talents or hopes or dreams. And, you know, listen to that voice within. Don't get a case of the shoulds. <laughs> I'm here to support you. I guess uh, what I would wish for every young woman is to have access to Gloria Steinem and her wonderful comments like that. Uh, <laughs> if you can, uh, it's, been, it's been a blessing to be in your life and to have you in my life. And, oh, Suzanne. Uh, I, yeah. I would wish that for any young woman who wants to make her own life. And I would wish that for uh, any young woman in your case. I mean, you by me are a young woman, of course. I'm older than everybody. But <laughs> but uh, no, they're, Suzanne, you are chosen family to me. Well, we're both lucky. <laughs> I'm going to ask because you just said something that is so profound. You have an amazing friendship, the two of you. You have this exquisite, gorgeous friendship. You started working together and you became really great friends. Do you have advice for women and friendship? Because you two are, you know, you have a whole history here and mm. you love each other, you respect each other, you honor each other, you hold each other up. And women need to do that right now. We need mm. to the ones who lift each other and hold each other. And mm -hmm. I would love for you to just talk a little bit about your friendship and how you honor each other, because we women need to do that, especially now in the world we're living in. Yeah, I, it probably, I'm just, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that probably in the culture in general, there is, it's still more okay to honor uh, your partner uh, and your children and your parents uh, and your grandparents than it is to honor your women friends. And I would just like to say profoundly that your women friends are also are your family and to to honor them and pay spend time and attention uh, and um, you know, just make make clear that they your women friends are your chosen family. Right. Well, I I think we we all know that as we get older, our women friends become more and more important uh, because they're chosen family, but because also. Um, uh, we can tell each other the truth. I mean, I don't think I would have gotten this old if I hadn't had a circle of friends I could laugh about it with, right? Uh, the other, the, actually, there is a, a, a scientific justification for this. Uh, when women get together, the experience of just enjoying each other's uh, company and trust releases oxytocin, which is the, called the love hormone uh, or the cuddle hormone. And what it does besides feel good is it reduce, reduces tension and stress. And in fact, a lot, there is a school of thought that the reason women live longer than men is because they have access to these regular doses of oxytocin. So the only pragmatic thing I would say is if you're busy people, like we all are, make sure that when you get together, you plan your next get together, that you don't wait 
till everybody goes home and then tries to get organized. And when you get up from the table, pull out your calendars and make sure that you've got another opportunity to look forward to. And that's, and I can testify to the fact that because of the dinners that we have, just, and I hope we continue to have once this in person, that we always do this, right? Once a, once a month, we have dinner and we then say, okay, here's the date of the next dinner. That's so gorgeous. With several others, right? Or, our Rob, friends. You, have, you have, what, five women that you've, or six women that you have dinners with? all the time or did yeah yes no we do right all right so this is going to be gloria this is for you and this is about the netflix show um mrs america so i have to ask ask it how did you feel about the accuracy of the show and i've recommended it to many of my work colleagues who are young feminists in their 20s who had never even heard of the era how do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that it was helpful in introducing people to the Equal Rights Amendment, to uh, many figures, you know, in the women's movement that people did not know. The problem is the fundamental premise was wrong. And if you go online, Eleanor Smeal and I wrote a, an op-ed explaining why because the idea of the show is that Phyllis Schlafly defeated the Equal Rights Amendment. And so it, it, the premise is that, that women are each other's worst enemies, <laughs> when in fact it was the insurance industry and people who stood to suffer economically because of the Equal Rights Amendment that defeated it. So the fundamental prevence, premise of the show was wrong, even though it no doubt served a purpose in introducing people to individuals they didn't know. Did they ask you for, did they come to you at all and say, this is what we're doing or? Yes, they did. I mean, they, um, the two, two of the showrunners, producers got in touch with me. And also I sent them to Ellie Smeal, who actually knows more about the Equal Rights Amendment than anybody because she was following it state by state. So both of us told them that uh, Phyllis Schlafly, as far as we could determine, never changed one vote, that she was window dressing on the economic interests that stood to lose by defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. And they went right on with the other premise. If you, <laughs> the, the, this, this, uh, it was in the LA Times that Ellie and I wrote. You can find it if you like. No, I, yeah, I read it, and, and I think we should link it, actually. On, oh, good idea. Right? We should link it. Let's link that. And Suzanne, what? How? I know a little bit about how you felt, but would you like to share? I no. hated it. <laughs> okay, there you have it. <laughs> I think what I hated about it was the way it did not portray the people, uh, the, the important people. I think uh, the Gloria character was cold. I think the Bella character was kind of uh, wishy-washy. Uh, everybody looked right, but the, the characters uh, were just so inaccurate that it made me crazy. Well, I think we should absolutely post the link to your piece that you wrote. And I think we need to have a hashtag, be Bella. And yeah. I think that we're ending the Q&A in one second. So I want to just thank you both for being here and for being the kind of women they name hurricanes after. And <laughs> so and we, we, we had to fight to get them to name an occasional hurricane after a guy. Remember that? Yeah. Because <laughs> that's very true. That is very true. <laughs> anyway, I, I thank you so much. And I thank you for this wonderful book festival. And I look forward to us all being together at it next year. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We are going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And here we go. Hi, can you hear me now? Some typical di di difficulties there. So thank you, Gloria and Suzanne, for that amazing conversation and for some history and some positive thoughts for the future. Tomorrow evening at 7.30, please join us for New Yorker cartoonists, Bob Eckstein, Roz Chaz, Matt Defee, talking about humor in trying times. I think we all could use a little bit of humor now. And we have two more conversations on Sunday. Legendary science fiction writer, Samuel Delaney at 1 p.m. And at 7.30 in the evening, we have a young author, George M. Johnson, discussing their autobiography of growing up black and gay in New Jersey. So we'd appreciate your tax deductible donation in any amount to keep the festival alive and ready to present to you again in person next year. Just go to our website at milfordreadersandwriters.com and click on the donate button. And please mark your calendars for next year and reserve the weekend of September 17, 18, and 19, 2021 for next year's festival. We hope to see you right here tomorrow evening, and thank you again.